Well, it goes like this the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, and the major lift. The baffled king composing, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. If me shebat kon kach mizman, חייתי פעם, ישנתי כאן, הייתי גם בודד וגם נגוע. זה אינו צליל שיוצא מכם, זו אהבת תורה שיודע עליהם, מזמור תודה כנס של הללויה. הללויה, הללויה. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. You say I took the name in vain. I don't even know the name. And if I did, well, really, what's it to you? everybody welcome we're so glad that you could come this morning this afternoon wherever you're zooming in from oh sorry the YouTube is playing more videos okay there we go um we're really glad that you're here my name is Vanya Green Esweed and I'm the president of the Fulbright Israel interest group um, president of the board, and we have a few other board members here. Um, we are going to be talking today about bridge building, and we decided that that would be a theme um, for now, and we'll see for how long we're able to um, work in this area of bridge building, because we feel like it fits well with the mission of uh, Fulbright in general, and also of our group, Fulbright Israel. Um, so um, bridge building is at the core of the Fulbright mission to build mutual understanding between nations, advance knowledge across communities and improve lives around the world. So that's the Fulbright mission. And our mission as the Fulbright Israel interest group is to connect past, current and future Fulbrighters in Israel and the US. So that's all of you. And we're here connecting together. Um, and so we're hoping to bring this theme to life with our two presenters who are joining us here today. 
Um, and then we'll also have an opportunity to go into breakout rooms um, or maybe if we have a small group, we can do it as um, a whole group and discuss a little bit more about how bridge building relates to us in our work, in our personal lives, um, as Fulbrighters, the work that we're doing currently, and then also ideas for future. Um, so we'll briefly introduce ourselves, uh, the board members, and then we're gonna have our presenters do some short presentation. So as I mentioned, my name is Vanya Green Aswiad, and I had a Fulbright to Israel for Voice in 2005 and 2006. And I researched and studied music in Ladino, uh, which also brought me to studying music, um, Arabic classical music, Turkish music. So definitely some bridge building there for me. Um, I'm also a licensed therapist and a board certified music therapist. Um, and I'm really glad to be here um, to see you guys. And I'm really, really excited to hear from um, Dr. Paula Raymond and from Dr. Maha Natur. Um, about their work. So I'm just going to briefly pass it off to Casey and she can introduce herself as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Casey Thorne. I'm the vice president of the Fulbright Interest Group uh, Board, and I am a Fulbright 2014 to 2015 um, scholar, and I studied dance. Erica. Hi, I'm Erica Tridel. Um, I was a Fulbright postdoc from 2018 to 2020 at BGU. Um, I studied religious studies, um, conversos in um, late medieval Spain, um, and I teach religious studies at Coastal Carolina University. Uh, Elana, are you here? Yep, I'm here. Hi, everyone. Um, I had to start this call in my car today, but um, I'm Alana Goldberg. My Fulbright was also at BGU. It was back in 2005, and I'm in the sciences. So I worked in a chemistry, solid state chemistry lab when I was there, and that led to me coming to Georgetown University, where I did my PhD, and now I work in the government um, as a project manager, program director at NIH, um, trying to build bridges between science and science communication uh, and all of that. Um, do we get everyone or is there one more person on our board? Lala. Okay. Lala. Uh, Lala, are you here? <laughs> yes, I'm here and I'm delighted to be here. I had a Fulbright in 2002 as a senior scholar. I had two other Fulbrights in addition to the one in Israel. I just retired last year as a professor at New York University in social work. And uh, I am very happy to be here and looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. So we have a pretty small group. Um, and so I'd like to give everyone an opportunity to just introduce themselves and um, also mention where you did your Fulbright and uh, where you're currently located. Uh, Stacy, would you mind, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Stacy Chaikin. I had a Fulbright from 2003 to 2005 at Tel Aviv University. Um, and I was teaching theater and performance. Um, and I'm in downtown Los Angeles now. And Great. in terms of bridge building, um, I wound up there um, on, with a commission to write a play in Israel. And I wrote a play called The Dig, which is about um, an, a genetic archeologist digging in Jaffa. Wow. Yeah. So lots of, lots of bridge building here. <laughs> Michael Furco, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, um, I am Michael Perko. I am a semi-retired academic and semi-retired Episcopal priest. I taught at Loyola University in Chicago. Um, I had a Fulbright in 2002 at Bar Ilan University. And my, uh, my area of interest, and it builds into bridge building a little bit, I think, um, is um, the place of, uh, of religious dialogue and interaction in conflictual societies. So that's one of the things that I've worked with. Uh, I still do some manuscript review for a couple of the Ben Gurion University's journals. And, uh, and also I spent about 20 years studying Zahel, studying the IDF 
as an agency for nation building. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about what you guys, um, your research, your work, uh, when we, after the presentations. And Claudine Schwaber, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I had a Fulbright in 2005 to with uh, <clears throat> Tel Aviv University. And at that time, I was at my un primary university, I was the vice president for distance education. And part of what I did was go to three or four different Israeli universities to help them, I can laugh at as I think about it now, start their online learning program, which is somewhat ironic given how far ahead the Israelis are now. But this was how to connect it with teaching, with other um, experiences and so on. And so I went to, I think, three of the four, about three or four different one universities. And I'm interested in this bridge building partly because I also spent many years as a mediator and I'm still part of a, a mediator group. So, uh, and I'm hoping to get back to that. I am now, uh, I was retired from my full-time job and now I'm adjunct at a GW here in DC teaching, ha ha, conflict management. So I'm happy to be here, but I have a, 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 a PS which is that somehow the email I got said this, one of them said it started at 1130. And I have to leave at about um, 20, of, 20 of one because I have a very important doctor's appointment. So Okay, but well, we're happy to have you here. Is this going to be recorded? Yes, we're busy recording it now. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I see Gilly from the commission just arrived. Um, feel free to introduce yourself if you'd like. I'm not sure if you're able to do that. Otherwise, we can um, do that later. Well, we're happy to see that you're here. And I'm going to um, now turn it over to Paula. Before I do, I'm just going to give a brief introduction um, so you know a little bit more about um, Paula Raymond and her work. Dr. Paula Raymond is a professor emerita at University of Massachusetts Lowell and founding director of its Peace and Conflict Studies program. She was director of the Radcliffe Public Policy Institute at Harvard University and a Radcliffe Bunting Fellow and Fulbright Specialist Scholar. Her research and activism focus on gender and peace in conflict regions, equity and inclusion in the workplace and nonviolent strategies for justice. Um, Paula and I have been in touch over the last few months um, talking about bridge building. Um, she has a wealth of information. I'm sure we're not gonna be able to touch on all of it today, but I'm just really excited to hear what you have to say. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Dr. Raymond. Thank you, Vanya. And um, uh, thank you to the whole team and thank you for all the it's wonderful to meet all the participants. Um, I think the Fulbright has offered all of us an opportunity in our own ways, just listening to all of you. Um, many people here have already started building bridges in your own fields and ways. So uh, um, a real blessing and privilege to be with all of you today. Um, I'm going to <clears throat> speak briefly um, about um, a project that happened as part um, of my um, Fulbright specialist. I was a Fulbright uh, senior specialist from 2008 through 2015. I went to both Northern Ireland and Israel many times um, at Queen's University in Northern Ireland and um, at University of Haifa in Israel. Um, what I'd like to speak about today is a particular um, story that relates to bridge building. Um, and it uh, reflects the concept that has become very important in the peace and conflict studies field. And um, especially with all of my international students, um, my students from Africa introduced me to this concept called Mbutu which some of you might be familiar with, U-B-U-N-T-U, Mbutu. 
and it means my dignity rests on yours. And it has become um, not just a term, but um, very much setting the scope for many people's active research, um, particularly in conflicted areas of the world and how to build bridges in order to create a culture of Ubuntu. The story that I want to relate, which is um, something that happened during my Fulbright experience, um, was done through the auspices of an organization in Israel called Families and Parents of the Bereaved. All members of that group have lost um, a beloved one to the violence that has happened during the conflict. It could be a sister or brother, a daughter or son, a wife, um, somebody else in your family. There are 4,000 members of this group and I've been working with this group now for three decades, even before I had the Fulbright. Um, but when I became a Fulbright, I decided to focus in on the women that were part of this organization. I had the opportunity <clears throat> to meet with 40 of the women members of this group in a place called Beit Yala, which is in the occupied territories in the West Bank. Um, and we brought together 40 women, um, very diverse group, um, diverse it was diversity in terms of age with people from their 20s to their 80s, people of different abilities, people, some of them had different disabilities, um, people who were um, Muslim, Christian, and Jews um, that were um, from both Israel itself and from uh, the West Bank. Um, and, um, the day that we had together was focused um, in a way of using art as hope in order to build a safe environment for the women to create a sense of belonging with each other. And the work that I'm describing is also based on the work um, of the well-known um, peace uh, researcher Jean-Paul Litterac from Notre Dame University, who talks about how do you build healthy communities, which of course have to be based on building bridges. To do that, you need to have safety, you need to have belonging, and you need to have a sense of purpose. What we did with the women in the day that I was with them was I brought along with me an art therapist and it might interest some of you, some of you are in the arts um, in different ways. And we brought clay with us and the 40 women and myself sat together and silently um, to diminish the problems of cross language issues. Um, it was a silent um, workshop and each of the women made a small bowl out of her clay um, and then she was asked to put into the bowl um, a slip of paper that gave one word that allowed her to feel a sense of hope. And this was in very troubled times. Of course, there are continuing troubled times um, in that region of the world. Um, but we asked each of the women to put something that gave them hope. Um, at the end of building their little um, bowls and putting in their slips of paper. We had all those bowls put in the center. Every woman chose somebody else's bowl, not their own, and was asked to read out loud what the word was that um, was put in the bowl to reflect what gave them hope. And what was Amazing, and we of course did not know what the results of this active research were gonna be before. Um, uh, there were three major um, themes that came out. One was the word sunshine or um, kind of waking up and seeing the sun in the sky. Um, 
and it was in Arabic and it was in Hebrew. Um, and we called them the Sun Group um, that formed our first breakout group. The second that many women talked about were their children or grandchildren. So they became the kind of children and grandchildren group. And the third was um, something else in nature that inspired them to have hope, to kind of see the horizon in a, in a bigger way. And the women that divided into these groups represented all that diversity that I was talking about. It showed them very clearly that they had something in common with women that might be quite different from themselves in terms of their ethnicity, their religion, their age, et cetera. And this created a very important initial sense of safety, of feeling something in common with the other, with other people, and very importantly, a sense of belonging. And it was the first stage of what became a very long range project of building bridges among these women who then went out and expanded it to other women in the organization. So it, it's really with great sense of hope. Um, and I'm going to be going back in May, as it turns out this year, I just found out last week, um, to work with one of the groups that emerged from this group called uh, Women Waging Peace. Um, and we're gonna be meeting at Neve Sholom, Wadat al-Falam in uh, outside of Jerusalem and bringing women together to build on the original work that we did when I was a Fulbright. So again, I'm very excited about this and would be very, very welcoming of um, hearing from any of you that are interested in taking part in this project. Um, we have such talented people that are part of our Zoom, Vanya, and the rest of the people on the board. So um, I also want to say that this opportunity that was created by the Israeli Association of Fulbright gave me the wonderful opportunity to, to meet Maha and we established a sense of wonderful connection with each other on our first Zoom together. And um, the, um, the towns that are familiar to me from the Druze community turned out to be exactly where Baha was familiar with. And we felt, felt this sense of uh, cross-cultural commonality right away. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to be working with Maha on this project as well. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, I love hearing that story, beautiful story. Um, so we're gonna hear now from Dr. Maha Natur. She's a current Israeli Fulbright Fellow and a visiting postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University. She received her PhD from University of Haifa in May 2021. And her doctoral research focused on the individual and collective aspects of the belief in reincarnation. And tell me if I'm pronouncing this right. And then Notok, is that correct? Um, phenomenon among the Druze in Israel. In her academic work, Maha deals with the connections and conflicts between Druze ethnopsychology and dominant Western psychology. So Dr. Maha Natur, welcome, and you have the floor. So oh, um, thank you so much. And I'm so excited to be here today. So I'm going to read my uh, brief presentation and um, we will see how at the end it will connect uh, to the great things that you just uh, told us, Paula. So uh, it's an honor to be here with you today. I am grateful to Fulbright for the wonderful opportunity to share my research interests with you and tell you about my community and our beliefs and perceptions of life and death. I'm going to talk about reincarnation and the notok phenomenon among the Jews in Israel. I promise that by the end of my brief presentation, you will be more familiar with this belief and phenomenon. But let me first start with some quotes from interviews with my study participants. These quotes will take us into the world of the Druze beliefs and perceptions of reincarnation and the phenomenon of Nutaq. About loss and grief, 
one interviewee said, we die and are born among each other. You know, it makes it easier. It makes it easier for the bereaved parents. Today, a young person dies, you say, may God send him loving and good parents. In explaining the idea of predestination, another participant said, look, death, uh, the hour when a person dies, even if he is the greatest professor in the world, he cannot postpone this hour even for a minute because the prophet will call the soul, the soul. And when it's not his hour, even if the entire world gathers and shoots him, he will not be hurt. This is the faith. And the following quotations are about brotherhood. Our religion teaches us to guard our brothers. Protecting one's brothers entails treating everyone equally and respectfully. It is possible that in the next incarnation, you will be born a simple, poor person. Or perhaps you are poor now and God will put you in a better place in the next incarnation. So never lose hope and never underestimate anyone. And another participant said, faith makes it easier and it brings us closer together. Why? I mean, I didn't know he could be my brother in the next incarnation. We are brothers. Based on this, we feel close to our brothers in Hadar and Sweda in Syria because we are among them and they are among us. These quotes describe fundamental aspects of Hidru's belief in the incarnation and the Notok. I am aware that these ideas may appear strange to non druze that may and may be met uh, with skepticism. This is why I'd like to elaborate on the topic and describe the cultural logic in Druze beliefs and the Notok phenomenon. This close look, I believe, can reduce feelings of strangeness and allow us to meet the other and understand their narrative and the way they experience reality. I also believe that such a cultural exchange can encourage us to explore our own beliefs and opinions and to reflect not only on the other, but also on ourselves. The Druze live mainly in the Middle East. In Israel, they are a religious minority within the Arab minority. The Druze community is collective, religious, traditional, and patriarchal. They are undergoing the processes of a transition and modernization. Druze are obligated to marry within their own group. The central characteristic of the Druze is their religion, which is kept secret and is known only to the religious. Reincarnation is a cornerstone belief in the Druze religion and is shared by most of the community members. The Druze believe that in every human, there is a physical and a spiritual element. At the time of death, the soul immediately moves to another human body while preserving gender, Druze continue to be reborn as Druze. Through reincarnation, one experiences all possible situations as part of divine justice. This belief has a profound social impact, a sense of shared destiny with large participation in funerals and celebrations. Burial ceremonies are minimal and gravestones are not customary. Regarding the phenomenon, nutuq in Arabic means to tell. For the Druze, it has a special meaning and can be considered a cultural idiom. The nutuq usually occurs in childhood and most often as a result of a tragic death. The young child begins to mention names or events unrelated to the immediate surroundings. Some children show anxieties and phobias or extraordinary talents. Some have emotional distress or behaviors that do not match their developmental age. Notok can be considered by Druze as an explanation for behavioral or emotional distress and can be categorized as solved where the deceased person was identified and unsolved when not. Solved cases can lead to meeting and developing a close relationship with a previous life family. Natiq in Arabic is the person who had Natiq. Natiq is male and Natiq a female. I interviewed Druze adults who had experienced Natiq, as well as Druze clerics and therapists as part of my research. The study sought a thorough understanding of Natiq experience and how it manifested itself in the lives of those who lived through it. 
the clerics offered a socio-religious perspective on the faith. At the same time, they made certain not to engage in deeper aspects of the religion, which are not available to secular Druze like myself. The Druze therapists, who were mostly psychologists and social workers, demonstrated a thorough understanding of the belief in the incarnation and the notok phenomenon and their implications for the community. At the same time, the analysis of their interviews reveals a conflict of loyalty in which they feel obligated to both notok discourse in the community and the professional psychological discourse, which primarily which is primarily Western secular and has difficulty accepting phenomena such as notok. I am telling you about the research findings with focus on the conflict, because in my opinion, the conflict between a Druze ethnopsychology, in this case, and secular Western psychology holds an opportunity. The recognition and capture of this friction among Druze therapists, as well as other minority therapists dealing with cultural phenomena with their communities provides an opportunity to build bridges. Following up the important things that Paula mentioned, in order for this to happen in an authentic and empathic way, there needs to be a deep understanding of the various narratives, as well as a willingness to listen with the bracketing of the viewpoints of each side and giving the other an opportunity to express their position without fear. This will also require the recognition of power dynamics between various groups, as well as an inclusive discourse that recognizes the complexities of reality and their variety of the truth about it. I deeply appreciate your listening and attention, and I invite us to consider how the Druze case fits or contradicts our personal, religious, and collective perceptions of life and death. Can we imagine the reality of the other, the Druze in this case, in our minds? What might make it difficult for us? What is required to accept a narrative so different to our own? And what could break down obstacles of strangeness and otherness? Thank you. Thank you so much, Maha. Those are great questions. I was going to open it up to the group for questions for our presenters, but you've already given us some questions. So um, let's see if we have some questions for our presenters, and then we can go from there and maybe answer some of your questions. So does anyone have any questions for Paula or for Maha? Lala. Yeah, I, it's not so much a question as much as realization. My daughter is a Buddhist Lama, so I know something a little bit about Buddhism and thinking about the reincarnation from a Buddhist perspective. What I didn't realize the difference between what Maha was saying that in Buddhism, you can be reincarnated as an animal or something different. But it sounds like you know, what Maha was saying, from your perspective, you become another human being, which is a very interesting view because anybody you can meet can be part of your soul in the next life. So thank you for explaining it. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for your comment, Lala. It, it, indeed, I think that the may, maybe my concept in Buddhism is karma and you reincarnate according to your uh, uh, actions in life and and the main concept in the Druze community is divine justice so you will be reincarnated as a human being and have the opportunity to prove your faith in mm -hmm. these different lives so yeah thank you, thank you. great for your daughter yes. <laughs> um, I have a question for you Maha um, I'm wondering you told us about some of your interviews um, with Druze community members. And I'm wondering if you've interviewed therapists. Um, it sounded like you had, and if you can share any quotes from them or reflections they had on that, um, the difficulty of both using maybe their Western training 
and then meeting their clients where they are with, um, with the experiences that they've had. If you can talk more about that. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I, I interviewed a social workers and psycho Druze social workers and psychologists and, and um, oh, I end up calling them cultural strangers because they, they, they uh, um, you know, they are, they were born in the Druze community. They're, most of them continue to live in Druze villages, like Dalit el Carmel, the village that Paula visited and Darcefia, uh, for you that are familiar uh, with these villages. So they continue to live in the Druze villages and they are all the time a, a hear about a, the, the reincarnation and, and the Nutuk. They live into this reality. So if, if a, a Druze a client wants to uh, seek uh, professional help, they will choose a Druze therapist, okay? Because they feel more comfortable and because it has to do, it, it, it is related to a religious uh, uh, faith, so they prefer a Druze therapist. But about these therapists, they are very much obligated to the ethnopsychology explanatory, explanatory models of the Druze families that come to seek help but they explain the difficulties as has to do with the notok and reincarnation but these therapists during their um academic study and their you know practice later they mostly don't deal with cultural phenomena or with and with the notok and and they they have a different a uh, a uh, discourse a different lexicon to explain you know uh, a, a, um, these difficulties and and they in in one hand they they can't uh, uh, ignore what the family what the parents have because they themselves are druze too on the other hand they they have no legitimation to to discuss this with their colleagues or you know, in academia or in the field work, because it can sound nonsense or it can sound very weird and it's not serious. And so, yeah, they shared a lot of um, a, a stories or, or positions about this, this conflict. Mike, I don't hear you. Michael, you're muted. I'm trying to help you unmute. Let's see, ask to unmute. There we go. I just, I just unmuted, I think. <laughs> um, I'm struck, Maha, and I wonder if you've dealt with this at all, by the contrast between the way that um, therapists who come from, from the Druze community interact with, with Druze. And I've been reading lately about um, a very comparable situation with uh, psychologists and so social workers who come from the Haredi community and are dealing with it with the Haredi. And my impression is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, my impression is that um, that they are given more, uh, if you will, professional position of uh, permission by other therapists and by the therapeutic community to do their therapy very much in the context of, of Haredi practice and belief, even though those are in their own ways, at least as culturally alien as, um, as Druze beliefs are in Israel. I wonder, I, I wonder if you have some experience there, if you can do a little bit of a comparison and contrast, because what I'm hearing you say is that in a certain sense, Druze therapists are sort of caught between, on the one hand, trying to deal with the cultural realities, uh, including the cultural religious realities of the Druze community, and if you will, the, the norms or the canons of the professional community which at times I think would be, as you're saying, perhaps culturally insensitive 
in terms of dealing with with Druze religious beliefs. Does my question make any sense at all to you? Of course, and I, I think one important thing that may I, I can take this research on is a comparative research with with uh, minority therapists or therapists from uh, a, a different groups. And what I hear from you that what you read about the the Haridi the Haridi therapists they they didn't face uh, a, such a conflict. They were more comfortable in using local ways of intervention or a religious dealing with religious aspect so yeah th this is a, a great question and i think that comparative research can teach a lot about what allows this and what makes it more uh, challenging to use you know your own knowledge and because the druze and the haridi therapists are, are experts in their culture and they know the nuances they know very well the discourse and the context and i think that this is the opportunity i think they can be um very good translators of for, for these phenomena and for the cultural I, reality to i to wonder others. if we're not talking in some ways about cultural hegemony here if there were as many druze as there are Haredim in israel the problem might not exist in the same way. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that part of it maybe have to do with simply the, 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 the size of the Haredi community and the fact that clearly it is in the cultural ascendancy. Certainly we only have to look at the current government to realize that. Uh, at, at the end of the day, perhaps it's easier for them to gain legitimacy because while they're a minority, they're a more hegemonistic minority than the Druze are, as far as I can see. I absolutely agree with you, and I think this is the a, 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 these are the dynamics that I was talking about, and that we should be aware of. And you know, when I met Paula, I was so excited that she heard about the Druze and she met the Druze women, and like it's not taken for granted and I don't know how, <coughs> how many of you uh, heard about the Druze before so you're absolutely right like in terms of numbers and being a very small minority that has its own conflicts in you know in uh, so yes this is this is one part of the uh, differences between the two groups yeah thank you these are great questions thank you oh uh Stacy, is it Chaikin? Yeah, Stacy Chaikin. Okay. So, hi. Th this is absolutely fascinating. I mean, I'm I'm a story person, and I write plays, and and so you know, this is like my stuff. I'm I'm just really curious how, um, if if a cultural belief, I have two questions. One is, um, as a secular Druze, how does one hold the notion of notuk? At, since it seems to permeate um, and in terms of explaining lots of stuff, uh, a, lot, a lot of phenomena, a lot of um, stuff, um, how, how it's held by secular uh, Druze. And the other question is, does a holding of a, a, of a belief like that that's so central to the, um, you know, the, the, the sense of reality of a group of people, does it cause conflict? And how does it cause conflict with, um, with neighbors or people they come into contact with? Uh, when you introduced yourself, I was thinking, wow, that's great. And, and like, I, I love your field. And, and the, I think that Motok is a continuous narrative that can, be uh, you know written yeah. about endlessly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. For for your question, I I have to say that, and I think Paula, maybe you also sense that that the Druze, even if they are secular, they are traditional and they do believe in the Druze religion. So like it's a different sense of secularism compared to other cultures. So like they 
the way they dress, the way they behave, the mm -hmm. fact that they don't marry outside the community, mm -hmm. even if they are not religious and they do respect the the rules of the community. So, so the reincarnation is one of the most important beliefs that connect those who don't know exactly the religious, you know, books and for to the to the Druze religion. So they most of the Druze do believe in 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 reincarnation and uh, for them it's it's one of the most important parts of the Druze identity, Druze religious Got identity. It. Got it. But also just Druze identity for people who don't consider themselves religious, they still this is a central identity exactly. point in Notok, this very specific mechanism of reincarnation. Exactly. And you know, for your about your second question, it it doesn't I I don't think it leads to conflicts with others. It more leads to very strong connections inside. So the the Druze are connected to Druze in Syria and Lebanon in the small groups in mm -hmm. uh, you know diaspora they feel that they are brothers and sisters so it it leads to a very a, a strong relations be, between the the group but also an, an i'm i'm inferring an insularity meaning only marrying them within the group on staying within the group where that precept is is held is that what you're saying Yes, and you know, like even in terms of where they live, so the I, Druze, yeah. the 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 two villages that, and Paula, I think you also visited other Druze mm -hmm. villages. They mm -hmm. are homogeneous. Where they have yeah. mostly Druze. Okay, some are you know have other religions, but but the Druze villages are in mountains, you know, located in mountains, separated, kind of separated yeah, from yeah. others. And and they have mainly Druze inside. So, right, yeah. Um, one one comment. Um, I think we have to be careful about making sharp distinctions between religious and secular, especially in in the context of Israel Palestine. You know, I, I lived for a time at uh, on a kibbutz in the south at Hatzarim, which is a profoundly secular entity, but they still lit candles. And, and broke bread on, on Shabbat evening. Uh, and the same thing would be true of the Christian community. I, I think in my experience is that in Israel, even people who call themselves secular in many respects may not be, if you will, theologically religious, but certainly they're culturally religious. And I, I think we need to be careful when we throw those terms around. Paula, go ahead. Yes, um, I I just want to kind of join what Stacy was saying with what Michael was just saying, and back to Maha um, inclusion on this. Um, our whole concept, um, kind of Westernized concept of secular versus religion, really does not hold in most of these yep. situations. So, and if you, some of you may have watched the Netflix thing, um, Unorthodox. I don't know if some of you saw that, and I just point to that. Um, that this also has particular meaning for women. And it's how I got to know the women of Isafia and the, the towns that Maha was talking about, who were really leaders in the fight on behalf of the Jews community. Um, whereas um, women in other parts of Israel did not have um, this, their, the same role um, as women within the context of their own culture and religion to do that kind of resistance. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that in addition to what Stacy and Michael just brought up as how we need to be extremely sensitive and caring when we use words that seem very opposed like secular and religion, um, it, it has, it's much more complex than that. Um, it certainly had came out when dealing with the women that I've been working with, the meaning for them within the context of their own um, culture um, and religion and what it meant to be um, the caregivers 
um, the people that gave birth in those communities, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm bringing that up just to say that for all of us who have knowledge, which everybody here does, about Israeli um, Palestinian society in a certain level, that this is extremely important and significant issues that we're talking about. And in terms of back to where we started with building bridges, that really listening and learning to each other about the, these complexities and their meanings and the stories and some of the things that some of you brought to this um, um, deserve so much more attention. And, um, and we're, we're really hoping to be able to work on that more from all the different fields that are represented on our Zoom today. Thank you so much. Um, so Casey's putting a, a link in the chat. Um, I don't know that we'll be able to really go to it and answer the questions today because um, we just have a few more minutes, but um, some questions, food for thought, and maybe on your own time, people can start to look at these questions and answer them. And I believe they can be a shared document. Um, so we can always go back to it and some reflections. Um, one question that I think this brought up for me today is how these insights, um, and this is maybe something also that we can discuss very briefly now or um, write up in the document, um, how these insights strike you and apply to the work that you're currently doing or that you would like to do in the future. I know, Paula, as you were talking, I was just thinking about um, I'm in an interface book group and we just read the book, The Red Tent, and we had our meeting last night. And it was very interesting to hear the different perspectives on this book that's like a re rewrite of our biblical history um, and from a woman's perspective. And then also to hear the Jewish and the Muslim and the Christian perspectives on um, you know, how that might be viewed in your own community and all of the issues that it brought up. So what you were talking about um, sort of built, created that tie for me. And I'm wondering for others, we just have a few more minutes, but if anybody would like to share um, some insights that you had or some tie-ins you have to um, other current activities that you're doing or things you'd like to do in the future. Yeah, go ahead, Lala. Yeah, I just was wondering from Paula if she could elaborate more what she sees, how we can move forward. I think she had some ideas and I would like to hear more about them. Well, I think we did a wonderful story today. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that um, Maha and I and with Vanya talked about. And, and uh, this is really a wonderful moment, a uh, creative moment for uh, us, uh, uh, including you, Lala, and everybody on the on this Zoom, um, to really think what would the building project, building bridges project, might might it look like um, and go? There are, there are a number of possibilities um, um, that would involve um, each of our interests. And we, um, I mean, I've, I've been talking about building bridges for, 30, 40 years of my life um, using all sorts of different approaches to it. And meeting Maha was just been a wonderful addition to that um, in terms of really bringing in some of the Drew's perspectives, but also this um, how to embrace various cultures. What Michael said also about um, um, understanding that within each of um, the different cultural zones that people exist in, there are also many different voices. Vanya just talked about different voices on, on just a book group looking at a text and finding many different ways. So I think that the um, challenge in front of us, but also a creative moment here, and to be very inclusive, is that I imagine that I'm talking about um, the, the organization, the Israeli Association for the Fulbright would be very welcoming of trying to create, let's say, a two or three page brainstorm document about what would the building built bridges project look like. I know for myself, my particular 
focus has been on women's voices in that. But we each have our own um, um, aspects of this that we could bring to it. So let's see what we can come up with together. And I, I think that we have some very good leadership here from um, the Israel uh, Fulbright group um, to, um, and I've been thinking of a one to two year project that we could, some of us could be involved with together and with some of the people, or I say back home, <laughs> back in Israel and Palestine and bring that, their voices and perspectives into this as well. I, I, that, I think that would be uh, both possible and um, um, add, add to our legitimacy. Stacey, did I you have- I hope that was helpful, Lala. Did you have a comment or question? Um, I did, and I, I love this idea. And I love that um, each one of us comes from a, a, a different uh, point of view and comes with different skills. And um, I'm wondering how to do this as, as a group, if there can be kind of an open work session where, um, where we can, you know, just a, like this, a dis, you know, discrete one hour work session where we can um, bounce some ideas off of each other. And I would love to hear more about the project that you're doing at um, Wahata Salam in, um, in May. You know, that's some place that I've spent a great deal of time. Oh, wonderful. Um, and, I've, and here in Los Angeles, there's an organization called Newground uh, Muslim Jewish Partnership for Change. And I've been their story consultant for the past six years. So I work with groups of uh, Muslims and Jews to create, um, to create stories in the same room which is, um, you know, which can be challenging just in terms of meanings and things like that. Um, and I'm also moving to Detroit where there's a, uh, my mother-in-law lives in Dearborn, which is a largely Arab city, um, largely Arab Christian, but, um, and I'll be doing work there as well. So, I mean, this is something really close to what I do. Um, yeah. So we're going to save the chat um, from the meeting. And if you want to put your email in there, um, I don't think we have any specific plans for a project per se, but I think we have a lot of creative energy. And so um, I think we can, you know, capitalize on that, on that energy and just be open to seeing where things lead. So it'd be great um, if you want to be, involved in further discussions, um, if you want to put your name in the chat, and um, we can kind of see how to dovetail that with um, the work of the Fulbright Israel Interest Group. Um, and also feel free to take a look at the document, to put your name, to um, do any reflections, to share. Um, you know, this is just a, this can be an ongoing conversation. And I, as I said, I think it fits really well with the mission of Fulbright and with um, our mission as a group. Um, uh, I think uh, a good group for everyone here to be aware of, if you're not already, is Yehuda Stolov's Interfaith Encounter Association in Israel. Uh, Yehuda, uh, probably 20 years ago, started setting up small individual conversation groups among uh, Muslims, Jews, and Christians on all sorts of things. There are, there are academics groups, there are theologians groups, there's a midwife's group. And in many respects, what, what Yehuda has been doing is the very best of grassroots kinds of work. Um, you know, uh, you can, you can uh, I suspect Google Interfaith Encounter Association, but you know, on a, on a very, on a very uh, from the bottom up way of operating with most people who would not remotely be considered academic elites, they're doing some very, very interesting things in terms of bridge building that all of us really ought to be aware of. What's his last name, Michael? S-T-O-L-O-V. Maybe you Stola. could send, maybe you could send you. his link and we could include that. I, I think we're having going to, I, I think Vanya, myself and Maha, at least you're going to have a follow-up to this. And maybe we can put something 
together and include some of these things and then send it back out to everybody that's interested and kind of think about next steps in terms of building bridges. So again, feel free to put your um, email in chat if you would like to. And um, thank you so much to our presenters, to everybody for coming today, um, for starting this conversation um, and for you know, giving us opportunities to think, to um, maybe change perspectives and start on the process of bridge building. It was great to see everyone here and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah.